All right, good morning. You know, one thing I want to do before we get into the scriptures is I want you to pray for the bridge. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, that is a nightmare, right? Not only that, but I, I want to encourage you, and not in any specific direction, but to vote as the election draws near. Go out and vote for the candidate of your choice and pray that God will do what he intends to do through this next election. And I know you, just like I, will be so glad when it's over, right? Gee, it's a mess. Today we're going to be talking about being connected and what it means to be the local church and what it means to be under the head who created the church. I want you to think about this. Suppose someone were to ask you to draw a picture of the church, not physically, but what the church means to you. If you were to sketch a picture of what the church means to you, what would it look like? And here's a couple of things I think that some people might draw. Some might say, well, it's like a gas station. It's a place I go to, you know, uh, fill up my spiritual gas tank. It's a place I go to uh, when I'm running low and I get some worship, some motivation to, to kind of make it through the week. Some people might think of the church like a filling station or a gas station. Some might say, well, it's, no, it's more like a movie theater. I go to escape from the world, to come behind those walls with other people, to relax, to, to, to be somewhat, uh, you know, entertained, to have some uh, kind of feeling when I come out, smiling, feeling better. Some would say, no, for me, it's maybe more like, and they would draw a picture of a pharmacy or a drugstore. I go there to get my prescription filled. I've had some pain, I've had some bumps, I've had some bruises, I, I've had some difficulties. For me, church is kind of like therapy. It, it, it's a release for me spiritually and emotionally. So some people might draw that. They might draw a gas station or a movie theater or a drugstore. And some people might say, no, it's like a, for me, it's like a big box store. I can go there and I, I get a good product, something for the whole family, there's something for the teens, there's something for the kids, there's something for me. And all at a great price. I drop a dollar in the thing and like, this is good. I got all of that for a buck. So some people look at the church that way. But as you study the scripture, I'm pretty sure the church is not seen or defined in any of these ways. It's not looked at as a gas station or a movie theater or a pharmacy or a big box store. Today I want to take us through mainly in the book of Ephesians, and I want us to look at the church in two ways that it's painted by the Apostle Paul, the picture he paints, I believe uh, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, and one of them is the picture of a body. The other is the picture of a bride. It's not about fill me up or entertain me up or take away my pain or you know, give me programs for my family and I. But the church, well, from the very beginning, Paul describes it. And let me read this for you. He first starts off by describing it as it's a mystery. I don't think the Jews or the Gentiles believe that when Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, that his primary purpose other than salvation was to establish the local church. Certainly wasn't what the Jews were looking for. The Gentiles had no idea. But because of the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ came this whole new phenomena into the world known as the church that is filled with every kind of person, both Jew and Jew. And Gentile. Listen to these verses, Ephesians 3, verse 8. To me, Paul says, who am the least than the least of all the saints, the grace was giving that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, 
which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Known by the church. There was no church until the day of Pentecost when it began to be established. Because Jesus said, go, wait in Jerusalem, wait for the promise. So God paints this whole new picture of something that no one expected, and it's called the church. He pictures it in the Scripture as a bride with Jesus as the groom. He pictures it as a flock of sheep, and Jesus is the good shepherd. He talks about it as a building or a temple, and Jesus not only builds it, but he is the foundation and the chief cornerstone. And he pictures the church as a body, the body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, we have this verse in 22, 23, and he put all things under his feet, speaking of Jesus, and he gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So one of the pictures you have in the New Testament of the church is a body, and Jesus is, what is Jesus? Hello? <laughs> Jesus is what? He's the head. So you've got the body, which is you and I, and he's the head. The whole body, your body, my body, the church's body is all directed by the head. The body doesn't do anything unless the head directs it to do it, and that's the picture he gives here. The desire or will of the head is communicated through the body. The head tells the body what to do. The body does it. It works together. You know that from uh, Corinthians chapter 12. And so the direction, the will of the head is given, and members of the body together fulfill it. I, I want to illustrate this by having Daniel come up here, and we have this amazing thing underneath here. It is a um, chocolate donut <laughs> and some milk. So I'm going to be the head, and Daniel's going to be the macho body. <laughs> try, to try to imagine that. So, <laughs> so here we are. I'm, I'm the head. I'm going to direct my body. I was going to do this myself, but I got off sugar the other day, and I thought, you know, I can't eat sugar right now, so I'll find someone else who really loves sugar, and I found, I found Daniel. He was, very, he was very willing. Let's put it that way. Okay, so first of all, the head sees the donut, and he instructs the arm to reach towards it and the fingers to grasp it and lift it towards his mouth. The mouth prepares for the donut. By licking <laughs> and, and now that things are ready and fully engaged, the head says, take a bite of that donut. And it's amazing. It's, it's, un, it's unbelievable. All directed by the head, which the body loves to do, and then it reaches again with direction from the head to the milk. And this is whole milk. This is that crummy skim milk stuff. It tastes like a milkshake. And there you have the head giving direction to the body. Amen? Amen? Give this guy a round of applause. Okay, let's pray. That's it for today. Let's all go get a donut. Jesus is the head. We're the body. So he's saying that he has chosen to function to work through us. That's how he demonstrates himself. That's how he accomplishes his purpose, his will. Now, of course, he can do it independently, but he's chosen to use you. He's chosen to use me. I mean, he, he does it independently in Scripture. We, we know that story about Saul of Tarsus going to Damascus. He's persecuting the church, and he's literally uh, knocked off his horse. He hears a voice from heaven, and Jesus does that without anyone else, just himself. So he can do it, but... His normal process is working through the body, the church. I want you to hear this part. I want you to listen. 
Jesus is committed to, and it's his plan to work through the church, that's his desire. So, so what does that mean for us? That means we're to work together, to carry out his will, to help build his church. And also it means that we are to love the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved who? The church. We're to love the church just as you would your bride. I should love the church. Christ has united himself and his people, and he chooses to do his work through local congregations called the church, connected to one another like a body. You might say, well, John, I work better on my own. I work better independently. I don't like getting all, you know, involved and it's difficult. I don't want to get bogged down with people and all their issues. John, they have issues. And they're problematic to work with. I know that. They do. But that's what Jesus is about. That's what he does. He uses us. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, we have, have a verse. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. God says, I'm going to make myself known not just on this earth, but everywhere as they see me working through my body, the church. It's an, it's an amazing thing. He works through, he builds, he loves, he raises us up together, he shows his grace, his kindness through each other being connected through what the Bible calls the body of Christ or the church. So here's the question. Listen, pay attention. Why would you not want to be a part of his body? Why would you not belong? Why would you not serve? Why would you not give? Why would you not be present if that's what Jesus wants you to do? Why wouldn't you? This is my plan, he says. I'll be the head, you be the body. And when you get a clear picture of the church, of the connection between the body and the head, you begin to see the church in a whole different perspective. I remember when I first got saved, boy, it was all about what can I get. Yeah, the church for me was a gas station. The church for me, you know, was a big box store. The church for me was entertainment. Whatever I wanted it to be, that's what I would get. But that's not how the Bible describes the church. You know, this says like, you know, there, there comes a time as a child, I put away childish things. It's not all about me anymore. It's about him. It's about the body. See, the gas station, the movie theater, the drugstore, the big box are all a means to an end. What can I get? I'm going to get filled up. I'm going to get my pains taken care of. You know, I'm going to be entertained. I'm going to get this great deal. But that's not what Scripture describes the church as. They're about his love, about his glory, about his wisdom, about accomplishing his purpose through very unique and different individuals that he calls together and forms what I would call the local body of Christ. And this is his plan. This is his purpose. Listen, this is what Jesus is doing. He's building the church, and he'll continue to do it until he returns. And that's why the primary strategy of reaching the lost in the world is the planting of the local church. That's how he does it. That's what it's all about. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he would go from place to place to place to place. He would have converts who would come to Christ as he preached the gospel. He would establish them in a local group, and he wouldn't just walk away and say, okay, see ya. Hope you do okay. Okay. No, he would appoint leadership and elders because if he had not done that, they would drift back into the culture. They would drift back into Judaism. So he instructed them and taught them. And God's heart and his purpose is, yes, people being saved. But I would submit to you, at least from my understanding of Scripture, that that's just half of it. The other half for those who are saved 
is that they be connected and brought into a community called the body of Christ. That's his purpose. That's how he functions. That's how he gets his will done. The head works through the body. It'd be like me going over there and taking another bite of that donut and say, see, the head works through the body. That's how he works. Paul did more than just lead people to Christ. He planted local congregations all throughout the New Testament because Christ is the head. We're connected to him vertically, but there's also this horizontal connection with the body. Christ gathered us together. We are his people, and we are to serve him, and our calling is to gather to be a body responsive to his direction. I don't know if you ever watched that movie called 127 Hours. Maybe you saw it. Maybe you didn't. It, back in 2010, so it's been about 10 years ago. It's a story of a man. I got a picture of him named Aaron Ralston. That's him. He was at that time around 28 years old. And he was, well, he basically was a mechanical engineer, but he was an outdoorsman. Loved to, you know, climb mountains and walls. And he was in Blue John Canyon in Utah, by himself, coming through this deep ravine, this, this, this canyon, and he dislodged a boulder, and it pinned him to the wall. It was huge, and it, and it pinned his right arm to the wall, and he, he couldn't get loose. And the movie and the story, the true story is this, that he waited 127 hours, five days, pinned to the wall, his right arm there, Till finally he realized, no one's coming to save me. There's no way I'm getting out of this. So he took out a pocket knife, and he cut off his own arm. I know. I would have just said, this is it for me. He, he took a dull pocket knife, cut off his own arm. <laughs> Might as well use the sound effects. And, and he rappelled down 65 feet and then walk seven miles to safety. Now, here's the deal. Aaron can live without his right arm, but I bet you he would love to have it back, right? He would love to have that right Can you imagine losing your right arm? You would love to have that arm back. But that's how it is with the church sometime. Detached members of the body, not functioning where they should function, they belong nowhere, really. Oh, I just drift in and out. They don't have capacity to grow or opportunity to serve. They're alone. Oh, the church would love to have them back, but they won't come back sometimes. Let me, let me ask you this question. Are you connected to the body of Christ? And the follow-up question to that is, why not? If that's what Jesus desires for you to be, if that's how he functions and his will goes forth and what he does in the, our world and our community today is through the body, why would you not do what Jesus wants you to do or be a part of how he does stuff? In, in the book here of Ephesians in chapter 2, I, I just want to read a passage of Scripture. It starts with verse 19. And I love this. He says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. He's talking about the building here. And whom we're all fit together, and it grows into a holy temple, and whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God's spirit. Now, now, now listen. God saves us. I'm so grateful for that. But I'm glad he didn't just leave me out there on my own. I would have drifted away. I would have gone back into my old culture, back to my own life. It's been through the local church that I've been able to grow and change and, and be useful to the Lord because he's the head and we're the body. But you might be sitting here and say, well, John, you don't know how discouraged I've been by the church. You don't know how burned I've been by the church. 
And some of you sitting here might say, you know, I served, I, I, I tithed, I, I got involved, and, and I really believed, and I, I gave my, and then something happened. Someone sinned. There was a scandal. There was abuse. There was deceit. John, the, these people in the church, they are filled with all kinds of issues and problems and difficulties. I know. You know. You're a big problem. <laughs> we all are. I'm my biggest problem. And so the church is filled with people who have issues and problems. There's three things that have plagued the church year after year after year after year, and they also plague the world. It's called sin, it's money, sex, and power. Same things that plague the world. The Bible says in the church we have sheep and we have goats. They're both there. The Bible says we have wheat and we have tares. The Bible says that, you know, you have the carnal and you also have the spiritual. You have the deceived and you have those who walk in truth. You have good cops, you have bad cops. You have good fathers, good parents, and you've got some lousy parents out there. You've got some good donuts. These came from Breeze Donuts. These are good donuts. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and you've got some bad donuts out there. And you could go on and on and on. Don't let another's failure keep you from being a part of where God wants you to be and to function under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a huge mistake. You say, but I know a pastor. John, I know a pastor. I know he was right on for the Lord. I know he was producing fruit. I know he was doing great things. I know he was saved. He wasn't a phony. And he fell. And if he can't do it, why do I think I can? Do you remember Jesus in the garden? He had washed the disciples' feet. He had minister to them with the Passover, and he's there. Disciples are trying to stay awake and pray, and here comes the people to arrest him, to take him to be tried. And he's there with his men, and, and Peter, now listen, Peter, the one who walked on water, he walked on water. Peter, the one when Jesus kind of gave that, you know, a question, who do men say that I am? It was Peter who spoke up on the inspiration of the Spirit. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Peter, you're getting direct access to the Spirit. My Father has told you. And Peter said, you're the Christ. What does Peter do in the midst of difficulty and trial? He pulls out a sword. No one knew probably Peter had that sword. Peter's in the garden with a sword. He's supposed to be praying. And I'm not talking about this sword. And he cuts off Malchus, the, the, the guy who was a servant to the high priest. He cuts off his ear. Now, I don't think he was going for the ear. I think he was going for the head or the scalp. He, he, was, he was going to kill this guy. And the ear comes off. And the ear is no good for the body lying on the ground, right? Right? Yeah, you take your ear off. It's not doing you good. It's not doing itself any good. The body needs the ear, and the ear needs the body. So what does Jesus do? Jesus apparently picked up the ear. Can you imagine that? This guy's bleeding. He's probably screaming. Peter's like, what did I do? And <laughs> Jesus picks up the ear, and he puts it back on. And that's my prayer for some of you who might be here listening right now. If you're an amputated Christian, a believer who's disconnected from the body, Someone hurt you, even if they were a walk-on-water kind of guy in your mind, no matter who they were. I'm praying you hear the Lord saying, I want you to be a healthy part of the body. I want to put you back on. I want to make you effective. You say, well, John, I'm not gifted, or I'm too old, or I've tried that. Or there's nothing really to contribute. I don't have giftings. I, I, I've burned out. Well, there's another story in Mark chapter 3. Jesus is in a synagogue. 
And there's a man there. They're, they're tempting Jesus with this. They're trying to trap him. There, there's a man. I don't know what the picture looked like, but he had a hand that was incapacitated that didn't work. It says a man with a shriveled hand. So apparently this guy's hand was of no good to him. It was connected to the body, but it wasn't doing anything. It was just there. It lost its capacity for usefulness. And Jesus says to the man something interesting, something really paradoxical. He says to him, stretch out your hand. Uh, imagine the man saying, one thing cannot do, Lord, is stretch out hand. Can't do it. Not able to. Don't have the capacity. But here's what happened. The man stretched out his hand. And I think the image is and the, the, the biblical story is just that he tried it and as he started doing it, his hand became whole. He stretched it out. And if you're a believer and you're, you're, you're not connected to the Lord and, and, and you need to be, Jesus is saying to you today, stretch out your hand. Oh, Lord, I can't do that. Yeah, yeah go ahead. You can. Stretch out your hand. You have a work, you have a call, you have a purpose to fulfill. You say, well, is it easy? No, it's not easy. Is it painless? No, it's not painless to be a part of the church. Is, is, is it without hardship? No. Here's the deal. If you give yourself to serving Christ within His body, you're going to experience difficulty. You're going to experience rejection, hurts, bruises. That's just the way it is. Jesus was hurt and bruised. In, in fact, he says in John 15, verse 18, he puts it this way. He says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you're a believer, if you're part of my body, there are going to be people who reject you, who ostracize you, who say things about you at work, in your neighborhood. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He, he, he had a uh, always caring about, he says, in my body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. He said, you know, I, I put up with stuff that hurts, that kills me. It's not easy because of Jesus Christ. To be his body, his hands, to be identified with Jesus. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, we have an interesting verse. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Listen. Okay, so you got hurt. Okay, you got bruised in the body of Christ. To that I can say after being a pastor for 37 years, get in line. We all get hurt. We all get bruised. It's, you ever get bruised? Your body get bruised? Sure. It's, it's part of being a part of a body. And Paul says, hey, I know what it's like to carry around the sufferings of the Lord. But one day, here's the great thing, one day we'll be without spot and without blemish. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, it's, it says this, that he might present to her, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. No wrinkles, no spots. Everyone over 30 can say, praise God. <laughs> no wrinkles, no spots, no stains. Let's not lose sight of that, that this is in heaven. That God's accomplishing His purpose. The head is working through the body. There's bumps, there's bruises. But this is His will. This is His desire. That we be light and salt in this world. I've always been intrigued by, and I don't watch it a lot, but it's an interesting story. The story of Cinderella. Everyone knows that story. And sometimes I think of the church kind of like Cinderella. You know, it's, it, it looks a little ragged sometimes. To, to the outsiders, it looks ugly or, or people who count it of little value. But in the prince's eyes, in, in the eyes of the king, so to speak, it's a whole different story. The wicked stepmother wants to persecute it, but Christ loves her. And one day we'll present her without spot or wrinkle in a beautiful way. We're called to love 
what he loves. We're called to be the body, but we're also called to be the bride. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. and The two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning the church. This, this wonderful mystery of us being the body, but also being the bride. Listen. God has chosen a bride. It's his church. It's his church. If you love the groom, you love the bride. You don't separate them. God has put together. Let no man separate. If you hurt the bride, you're no friend of the groom. It, guys, if, if, you're, if you're with your wife somewhere and, and somebody is rude or hurtful to your wife or insults her, what do you do? Hey, go for it again. Yeah, yeah, get her. No, hopefully not. I'm on his side. No, you're insulted because you're one. He's put you together. Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus, and the Lord said from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul goes, persecuting you? Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. And he was persecuting Jesus because he was persecuting his bride. And that's how Jesus saw it. A lot of people in their spiritual growth and in their life miss this thing. They separate their love for Jesus from the church, from the bride. And they get into all kinds of other things. Now, I want you to pay attention to this part. I don't want you to misquote or misthink. They, they get into discipleship ministries. Well, I don't need the local church. I'm into discipleship ministries. This is what I do. This is what I am. Or they get into missions. You know, I, the church is fine, but hey, I'm into missions. I'm into going to the uttermost parts. Or they get into evangelistic organizations. No, I'm all about reaching the lost. So I'm involved in this evangelistic organization. Or I'm into this school, or whatever it might be. But I would submit to you that these are all kind of like the bridesmaids, all these parachurch groups. And they assist the bride as she prepares herself for the groom. They're, they're not the bride. Don't make more of the bridesmaid than you do of the bride. It's the local church. It's how the head works his will and his purpose out in our world. The more I get to know Jesus, the more significant and essential I see his church, his bride, his body, and it's beautiful in his eyes. Love for the church and love for his bride can be seen in some practical ways, and I'm going to close with these thoughts. Love for his bride is seen about how we speak. You know, you can really tell about a man and his wife when you listen to how he speaks to her, how he talks to her, how he speaks about her. If he's critical, complaining, my wife never, she always, instead of building up and encouraging. And you can tell how a believer cares about the bride of Christ by how they talk about the church. If it's always criticism and complaining, then there's something missing in your love for the groom. Oh, yeah, the, the bride has faults. But Jesus loves the bride, gave himself for her. Another way is, is time. How much time is given to the bride, to the church? And I could put it in this way, and, and, and you just take it for whatever it's worth. What drives your schedule? What's your schedule comprised of, your children's schedule? You know, what will be the fruit of it in 10 years from now, the schedule you're keeping? In 10 years from now, when it all kind of comes down to whatever, okay, I've spent this last 10 years, this has been my schedule, what's the fruit of it in God's eyes? Will you be able to stand before the Lord and explain why my family had so little time, quality time, for the bride? Oh, I was busy, Lord. Oh, yeah, I, I know you were. What's the fruit of that busyness? And here's a controversial one. 
how much do I give to the bride? How many of you guys know that on anniversary and Christmas and birthday, the bride loves to get stuff? <laughs> Maybe your bride doesn't. Did you know that 10 to 25% of normal congregations tithe? 10 to 25%. The rest, it's a big box store. Look at all this I get. 80% of believers give 2% or less to their church. You know, here's what I think, and, and just, just listen, because I know we're on thin ice right now. I would love to see our church come alive in this area, not so much so that we, can do, we could do more in missions and outreaches and all these bridesmaids things. We could do more, a lot more. But also to share the heart and passion of the Lord and just say, what you love, you give to and Lord, I love your bride, and I love your body. What I say, my time, my gifts, and how you serve. I just encourage you to, to, to find a place to serve in the body as the head leads and guides. It's so important. It's so fulfilling. And then finally, through presence. I, I don't know about you, but I think what my, life's, my wife's love language is just me being around. Spend time with me. She said, I'm going to put on your tombstone. I got to go. <laughs> I said, don't do that. She said, well, that's what you always say. I got to go. <laughs> Spend time. We just, we just took some time off this last week. We spent three or four days together up in the mountains and just hung out. You know, our, our big uh, thing in our culture is TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. You know, it's the weekend. And, and, and. I would love for us to have a passion together as a church to worship, to, to pray, to fellowship, and hungry and thirsty to hear God's Word together as the body of Christ. Some people come about once a month. Maybe they have a good reason. I don't know. I can't imagine I'd be married very long if I said to my wife, how about we work out this deal? Once a month we get together for me. Yeah. See, here's my prayer for you and for myself to be connected consistently, lovingly to his bride and his body. I think that's the heart of Jesus. I think that's his picture for us. Let Jesus say to you and say to me or any of us who feel like, well, I'm just not connected, stretch forth your hand and let me make it whole. Stretch forth your life and let me put you back on the body. Let me give you a, a hunger and desire to be a productive part of my body and to love my bride the way that I do. Let me make you, Jesus would say, a part of my purpose and passion in the world. And I believe without a doubt as you read through the New Testament, it's this wonderful, mysterious thing called the local church. And it'll be alive till he comes. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen.